the text uh, this morning is from Job chapter 21, verse 13. Um, and it reads, They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. So this here is Job talking, uh, referring to the wicked, and one of his responses to one of his friends who has given him a bit of a hard time after he had lost everything. Yes, poor old Job had suffered from a few moments. In a moment, Sabians carried off his oxen and donkeys and killed his servants. In a moment, fire fell from the sky and burned up his sheep and servants. In a moment, the Chaldeans stole his camels and killed more servants. In a moment, the house collapsed, killing his sons and daughters. And in a moment, he was struck with painful sores from head to toe. Mm -hmm. Yet after all of this, Job refused to curse God or accuse him of any wrongdoing. Job's response to all of these moments tells us what was most important to him. Mm -hmm. It was his God, not his wealth or possessions. Mm -hmm. So is this the same with us? What is our priority? Is our, much of our time and effort going into trying to improve our career, our house, our wealth, instead of trying to improve our knowledge of and relationship with our Creator? We can spend a heap of time and money extending the house, renovating the bathroom, improving the kitchen, and in a moment, an earthquake flattens the house. <laughs> we can work hard and save up to buy that nice car we've been eyeing up, and in a moment, another driver crashes into it and writes it off. We can spend so much time on our career, sometimes to the detriment of our relationship with our spouse or our children, and in a moment, the CEO announces redundancy to come. We can put so much time and effort into worldly endeavours and material things, and yet they can all disappear in a moment. And as the text says, so can our life. As I'm sure you've heard it said before, you can't take it with you when you go. While a house, car, job and money are not bad things, our material possessions and wealth can so easily disappear and will be of no benefit to us when we're dead. So the thing that I took from this text was our time and effort are best prioritised towards something that will be of benefit to us and others when we go down to the grave. And that is being in relationship with and introducing others to the one who wants to provide us with a new Better life after this one's over. Thanks so much, Shane, for those thoughts. And focusing on that concept of the one who wants something more for us, we'll have our song this morning, which is My Jesus, I Love Thee, a response to his love for us. Thanks, Ashley.
morning. Thank you, Ben. You sit there. Something that happened to me in a moment of time in Africa. Um, my life changed in a moment when a dog gave birth to 11 puppies while I was serving in um, Zimbabwe this year. About a, about a month and a half into my time in Zimbabwe, I was told by a boy that a dog had given birth to 11 puppies and it was on the Sabbath day, a true gift from God. And that night, there was a heavy heavy rain, as, a t as is typical in Zimbabwe. The children knocked on my door, and um, they said, Uncle Khan, the puppies are wet. What are we going to do? I replied, here, take this box and get the puppies into it. And then they brought them into my house, and the, mo the mother followed as well. Um, yes, so, okay. So here's a picture of some of the kids with the, with the dogs. Can you see that? Sorry, it's so small. And, um, yeah, I felt very sorry for the mother as well. She had been very skinny after the, um, after the giving birth to the puppies. So I fed her and the other dogs. I felt very sad uh, for her. I got the boys to help me out to make a cardboard uh, kennel for the dogs and put them inside there. I can remember God teaching me a lesson of fatherhood that night because I remember standing above, above the dogs when we first put them in there and thinking, uh, wow, this is what fatherhood is like it's like providing um, a home for you know for the most innocent uh, like forms of life which God can provide for the next week or two I cared for the mother and and fed her while she weaned the puppies and then for the next six months my life was filled with taking care of them I had so much fun with them and the kids we bathed them uh, here's a photo of me and um, Mark and Nathaniel over there bathing the dogs. We tried to do this to get rid of uh, fleas which plagued the dogs, which you can, um, which you can imagine over in Africa, very uh, profuse. They, they they would just multiply and multiply. And this uh, was like a, a big curse for the dogs. But I tried to show the kids the importance of taking care of the, um, the animals. And also we trained them. This is Donald over here teaching one of the dogs to sit. And we would take them for walks. And we just loved um, playing with the dogs. And um, I loved getting the kids over and getting them involved and in taking care of the animals. Later on, I, would I got them to be neutered and vaccinated as well. Um, now, the children's home has, has um, 11, 
or four, four puppies. These are the four puppies that we have. The, the, all the kids now um, can take care of these dogs. We have them just around where my house is, and so they guard around where, where I live. Yeah, so these are just a cup. These are the four dogs that we have, and um, I gave six of the way, six of them away to the SPCA, and one of them, one of them to one of my mates over there, and we cared for these four dogs uh, all the way up until I left, and uh, they're still being cared for. Thankfully, th these dogs are the only ones who survived because in the past the mother had given birth to another another litter, but uh, they all died, so it was like a testimony. To, to how God could um, preserve the life of these animals while I was there. And it showed the, showed the kids that the importance of taking care of their animals, which they uh, sadly neglected to do while I was there. But God allowed this uh, moment in time to change my life uh, for, the, for the good, and also He allowed that to change their life as well, so then they could see the importance of taking care of the things that God has made. With that, I'd like to pass over back to Damon. Thank you. Okay, well, let's sing again, shall we? And apparently this morning we're doing more than a murmur. We're going to, now that it's in our mind, we're going to put some enthusiasm behind it. Okay. We see the signs around us in the world today. We feel a sense of urgency. It's not the time to play. We see the world on a expiry date. There's tension in the air. And the clock keeps ticking steadily. God's children must prepare. some time with me and pray you're not wrestling with flesh and blood you need wisdom from above to carry out the great commission and share the message of my love fear god and give him glory his judgment hour is here the message will go with power we must declare Go to every kindred and proclaim without delay. With a loud voice, teach the nations. Worship God, King of creation. He is coming back, so give the final call. The time is now, don't put it off. Tomorrow's not yours anyway. There are souls out there with questions, and they're standing in your way. Eternal life or death, the call is sure, choose your destiny today. If you refuse, the rocks will cry out, straight the path, prepare the way. Fear God and give Him glory, His judgment hour is here. The message will go with power, we must declare. He says, go to every kindred and proclaim without delay. With a loud voice, teach the nations.
Worship God, King of creation. He is coming back, so give the final call. Fear God and give him glory. His judgment hour is here. The message will go with power, we must see where. He says, go to every kindred and proclaim without delay. With a loud voice, teach the nations, worship God, King of creation. He is coming back, so give the final call. Okay, let's have a bit of a study here. We're going to go to Luke chapter 22 as our main focus, but before we do, let's have a, a word of prayer, shall we? Let's just bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what we've already looked at this morning. We thank you for the blessings that you can give in a moment, which can um, be a challenge to us. But I pray that as we spend this moment with you now, that we can learn, we can be inspired and that you can take us from this place um, better prepared to serve you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> okay, so as I mentioned today, this morning, we are going to look at a moment for the disciples. Now, I shared with you yesterday morning uh, a little bit of a preview that the disciples had been following Jesus for about three, three and a half years by the time we get to the point in the story we're looking at. You remember that Peter and his brother were there working, mending their nets. Jesus came along and a moment of time he said, come follow me. Their career changed. They left their nets and they followed him. That was quite a change in their lives. And all of a sudden they are now following who they believe to be the promised Messiah. And incredible things start happening. All of a sudden it's no longer getting fish each morning, they're traveling to different places, they're seeing miracles performed, they're seeing lives being changed, just like theirs has been changed. But you consider, if we read through the gospel, we've got year one, year two, year three, and even with incredible things happening, life becomes a new type of normal after three years. And their characters are growing. Peter's still Peter. You know, we, we, I, I really love the, the way the Bible portrays Peter. He's impetuous, he's enthusiastic, he doesn't always get it right. In fact, quite often he doesn't get it right. But he is loved and he is nurtured. And we come along, about three years later, they're used to traveling, they're used to visiting with people, they're used to Jesus having a few interesting conversations with people that you normally wouldn't talk with. They're used to um, Jesus going places that normally Jews wouldn't go to. And then they've seen things like Jesus says, go, go find a donkey, we're going to ride this donkey into town. And all of a sudden, the Jesus that they knew seems a little different because now he's accepting something that he never accepted before, just towards the end of his ministry. But apart from these things, there was always many surprises with Jesus. Life becomes a new type of normal until one Thursday evening. And I really want you to think as we look at this, when is that Thursday evening, or when could that Thursday evening be in my life? Now, of course, they're coming up to the feast of the Passover. Come to Luke 22, and let's um, just follow the story here. I've chosen Luke for a reason, because Luke has a, a fairly condensed version of the story and a slightly different account. See, Luke was a doctor. He was a... Um, you could almost say a little bit more of an academic than a lot of other people. And when you read through the story of Luke, he's keeping facts, punching through. Um, and so I, sometimes if I'm really wanting to, the details, I'll go to Luke. Because he he's just records it in a slightly different way. We're going to jump in at verse 7. Luke chapter 22, and we're going to verse 7. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. Now, of course, this isn't anything too unusual. This happens yearly, and no doubt it's happened for the last three years I've been with Jesus. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said, Where do you want us to go and prepare this? And he said, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall be a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth, 
And ye shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished there make ready. Now we would say this is an unusual thing. Jesus just says, oh, go into town, you'll find a guy with a pot on his head, follow him, that's going to be the place. But, you know, even for the disciples, this wasn't unusual when you've been around Jesus for three years. You remember one time he said, go into town, you'll find a donkey tied up, and, um, and tell the guy that if, if anyone interrupts you, tell him, you know, Jesus needs it. So even this, I don't think at this time the disciples sort of thought anything was too unusual in their journey with Jesus. Verse 13, they went, and they found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And then Jesus starts to speak perhaps a little differently to what he had in the past. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now Jesus had been dropping plenty of hints about his suffering, something like this. What was the disciples' concept of what Jesus was doing? What were they waiting for Jesus to do? He was going to overthrow the Romans, he was going to be in charge, he was going to revitalize the Sanhedrin and all those that were running the church, and they had a false concept of Jesus' word. They were, they were waiting all these three and a half years for something to happen. They knew something was going to happen, but they had a different concept of what was really happening. And now at this time, Jesus is talking about suffering in verse 16, For I say unto you, I will not more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom. And then the next verses, it says he took the cup, he took the bread, as we are probably well aware of you know, how the Passover took place on that particular evening. And verse 23 says, or let's read verse 22, and, 22, and truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. They said, well, what's Jesus talking about here? Who is going to do this? And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. So on one hand, they're actually saying, well, who's going to betray Jesus that he's talking about? On the other hand, they're saying, well, I'm, I'm the greatest amongst them here. It wouldn't be me. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. And then he goes through and he starts talking about, you know, who's the greatest, challenging the ideas of the greatest. Jump down to verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. What an interesting comment to make to Simon. When you're converted, I've been with you for three and a half years when you are converted. And then it says there that Satan has desired to have you. And what's his response? Typical Peter response. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you. Prison, death, whatever, I'm on your side. He claimed to be ready to go to prison or death. Now we know the story. What happened later that day? He was scared of death. He was scared of prison. He was scared of ending up like Jesus was. So when Peter made this claim, he had no thought that that was going to happen at all. He was, he was ready to do other things, which we'll find here. And, it's, and Jesus said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Imagine what Peter is thinking here. This is a little different to usual. <clears throat> Let's jump down to verse 38. Jesus is still talking about things that aren't making sense to them. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. <clears throat> The physical arm, and we know later on Peter grabbed one of those swords and he started using it. But I love Jesus' response. He said, it's enough. And exactly what he meant by that, <clears throat> sorry, the words aren't particularly clear. But Jesus either said, yeah, two swords is plenty. Or maybe he was more inferring, that's enough. Just quit that. And I, I don't know, maybe if we studied into this topic, we might find a bit more. But regardless, he was just saying, you haven't got the point. Now, three and a half years and they haven't got the point. But let's continue um, to read further down. And it says, And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. It says, As he was wont. What does that mean? As was his habit. Okay. So this isn't anything out of the usual either. They've had the Passover supper together. Jesus has said a few unusual things. Peter's possibly a little offended by what's been said about him. 
But they've gone out to the Mount of Olives, not a particularly unusual thing. They go to pray. Now, Jesus challenged them, pray that you won't enter into temptation. Whether this is unusual or not, I'm not sure. What, whether Jesus would normally say this sort of thing unto them. Then he went away from them and he prays. And we know the story of what happened in Gethsemane. He comes back, they're sleeping again. Why were they sleeping? Because nothing was particularly unusual. If it's a very unusual event, they'd be alert. They'd be wondering what's happening. But no, they're sleeping. And it happens multiple times. And then in the end, Jesus almost comes and says, okay, whatever, the time has come. And then... We're just skipping from the, from the text here, but we know what happens. All of a sudden, a crowd comes to attack in the middle of the night. Who's at the head of them? Judas. Judas. He'd slipped out of the, the Passover feast because Jesus had told him to do what he needed to do. Jesus is betrayed with a kiss. And it's incredible that the, the throng come, they come to attack him, and then in a moment, divinity flashed through humanity, and they all fell back like dead men. Wow, things are a little different. Jesus has done many things. There's been many throngs around Jesus, and he's normally responded with words, simply in a way that just confounds them. But this is a physical, tangible divinity, just knocks them flat. And everything sort of settles down again, and they continue their job. I mean, surely. <laughs> but anyway... Peter responds in his way that he sees best, and Jesus says, Peter, put the sword away. We don't need the sword. You can imagine the turmoil in the disciples' minds here. This is a little different. Something's really happening here. Now, of course, Judas, we understand, has been doing the, his part of it. We need to prompt Jesus along. We need to get something happen. Jesus doesn't quite get it. If I betray him, he'll do this magnificent stuff, and he'll step forward. But Jesus gets taken, and he gets tried. Peter says, I've got to follow along. And of course, he denies three times because he's just scared, scared of what's happening. He wasn't prepared for this. That night, through the night, the trial continues. In the morning, he is taken from person to person. All of a sudden, the disciples aren't following Jesus the same. They're watching from a distance. In fact, they're going and hiding in an upper room. Jesus is dead within 24 hours of things starting to go different. You see how a moment in time can transform our dreams? Jesus was going to overthrow the Romans. He was going to be the, the leader. He was going to change the world. Now he's dead and he's in a tomb, less than 24 hours after life was normal. And I think about our lives. Our lives, we're doing good. We're following Jesus. But do we have the right concept of what we should really be doing? You know, sometimes we're striving to be the greatest. Or maybe we are you know, thinking we need to work things so we can get Christianity the way it should be or get God doing what he should be doing. Within 24 hours, their dreams are totally dashed. But if they had understood, they would realize this is exactly what should be happening. And they should have been so pleased to be right there when the action was happening. So they're hiding in the upper room. Why are they hiding? They're afraid, well, they're afraid of the Romans, but they're afraid of the Jews. They're afraid of, the, the, you know, you're his followers, and they've been faithfully following him all along, and all of a sudden they've got rid of the leader. They're going to get rid of the followers as well so that this doesn't continue. That's right. They don't want this to continue. And what did the, the Pharisees were very worried about this. What did they even say? We're going to put a Roman guard around his tomb because his disciples are going to come get him out and continue this conspiracy. They're going to deal with the body and say, look, it's empty. He's raised and they're going to continue this whole thing. They were aware that Jesus had talked about raising from the dead, but the disciples have somehow not really got the point. They're hiding for fear of the Jews. They're hiding for fear of being the same as Jesus. They didn't want what happened to Jesus to happen to them. And... Listen to this quote here. This is from Desire of Ages. It says, Trouble seemed crowding upon trouble. On the sixth day of the week, they had seen their master die. And then, on the first day of the week, they found themselves deprived of his body. Now, the, the Jews, the Pharisees, had said they're going to steal the body, and this is going to be a problem to us. The disciples find the body's gone, and now it's a problem to them. Everyone's a bit worried. What's happening with Jesus' body? And on the first day of the week, they find themselves deprived of his body, and they, 
are accused of stealing it. For the sake of deceiving the people, they despaired of ever correcting the false impressions that were gaining ground against them. Have you ever feel in a situation where there's false impressions, false rumours against you and you fear, I can never deal with this? This is exactly how the disciples are feeling here. They feared the enmity of the priests and the wrath of the people. Now, I have to laugh at this situation. The disciples are fearful of the priests because they're being accused of stealing the body. In the meantime, the priests are fearful of the disciples that they're going to start this rumour and, and change things. So there's two different entities, fearful of each other, going nowhere right at the moment. They longed for who? They longed for the presence of Jesus who would help them in every perplexity. At least they knew what the solution was, but where was Jesus? As far as they knew. He's gone. He's out of the picture. If only we still had Jesus. If only we had something that we're confident that we could hold on to. Often they repeated the words, we trusted that it had been he who would have redeemed Israel. Lonely and sick at heart, they remembered his words. If they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry they meet together in the upper chamber. They close and fasten the doors, knowing that the fate of their beloved teacher might at any time be theirs. Right now, in this situation that they are facing themselves, is the most incredible part of human history on this earth. There's going to be a more incredible part which takes place off this earth. But right now, Jesus has come. He's died for the world. Redemption is made sure, and they're locked up scared. They didn't get it. And they didn't get it because they didn't understand the prophecies. And you know, that hits here a little bit. We've got the prophecies, we're reading the prophecies, and I'm sure each one of us in our mind, we have this concept of how prophecy will be fulfilled as we get towards the end times. And we may well be right on a lot of it, but you know, I'm sure a lot of it will catch us by surprise. Because once you form a picture in your mind, it's hard to think differently to that. Now we have spent a lot of time looking at the Old Testament, we're looking at Jesus' first coming, and we're looking at the prophecies. But the problem that they had at this time is they were looking for a physical, tangible return of Christ to transform the earth. Unfortunately now, Christianity is not looking for that. What they're looking for is Jesus to come as the first coming, as just a being to come to this earth and, and transform it and change it. We sometimes, the prophecies for the first and second coming have been quite mixed up. So we need to be very aware as we're studying that we're following Jesus and being prepared um, to follow him with what his plans are, not what we perceive the plans should be. Listen to what it says here. It says, Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as a, what? Overwhelming surprise. Now we're going along in our lives and we're doing good things. We're, you know, living our lives. We're making our money. We're sharing with other people. We're doing a lot of what the disciples did. And prayerfully, we're not doing what the average person was doing. We're doing what the disciples were doing. We're following Jesus. But still, it's going to break as an overwhelming surprise, even for us. And this preparation they should make by diligently studying the Word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. There's the key. This is how you prepare. You study the word and let it transform your life. And let's carry on through this quote here. The tremendous issues of eternity demand of us something besides an imaginary religion, a religion of words and forms, where truth is kept in the outer court. God calls for a revival and a reformation. The words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit, but the Bible has been robbed of its power and the result is seen in lowering of the tone of spiritual life. In many sermons of today, there is not that divine manifestation which awakens the conscience and brings life to the soul. The hearer cannot say, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us by the way and while he opened the scriptures? There were many who are crying out for the living God, longing for the divine presence. Let the word of God speak to the heart that those who have heard only tradition and human theories and maxims hear the voice of him who can renew the soul until eternal life. Let's jump across to Revelation 14. Each morning we've been looking at situations that were radical, that changed in a moment, but we've also been looking at the three angels' messages as the solution to, to that problem. So we're going to Revelation 14, and so far, with the first angel's message, we've looked at the focus is on God, not on what's happening around us. The second angel's message is be aware 
that there is a Babylon out there, but it's fallen. Then we also learnt, don't worship, don't focus on, don't be deceived by the beast and its image. Now let's look at the next portion, which is, so that's the three angels' messages, but then after it there's verses 12 and 13. And it says, here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours and their works do follow them. Now verse 12 is common, we, we speak of it often. But it's, it's interesting, it talks about the first angel's message, the second angel's message, the third angel's message, the three lessons we've already got from it. But then it says, here is the patience of the saints. Through this is manifested. This is the key to having the patience of the saints. And it's those who what? Keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. These are also the qualifications of the remnant, those who will endure during this time that is going to be such a change. But I love the way that verse 13 is right there after it, which we often don't connect with it. It says there, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours and their works do follow them. This is an encouragement from what we've just had. This encouragement is there's a blessing here and they can rest from their labours. So I think the, the key thing that we we are looking at here through the three angels' messages so far, fear God, give him glory and worship him. That should be our focus. Not all the disasters happening around us, not all the, the moments in time that are causing stress. Let's focus on Christ. But be aware, yes, this world's in a mess. Don't focus on that. Don't worship the beast in his image. Keep away from that. And then you'll be blessed Amen. if you follow Christ keep his commandments and as we focus on that this order of things in our lives all of a sudden the spending the time on everything that's happening around us all that is is information fulfilling prophecy so that when the time comes we're not like the disciples where we're waiting for Jesus to do this when Jesus has a totally different much better plan for us so let's let's prepare in the best way that we can which is I mean, we need to do tangible things, we've got a real life to live, but it's the heart that's really going to matter and then the rest of things will fit together around that. Tomorrow we're going to continue, but we're going to look at the flip side of it. Tomorrow we're not going to look at another disaster that comes or another change like that. We're going to look at how God can change us for the better. And then, although we've finished the three angels' message in the verse after it, there's actually the fourth angel which gives power to that message and we're going to see how that fits in with the ultimate message of God, what God wants us to do. Let's, um, let's close off with a word of prayer. Let's face today and let's see how we can spend this time preparing and encouraging each other. Let's just bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these examples in Scripture that you give us. You tell us even about the disciples who got it quite wrong, but yet you still loved Peter despite his impetuous ways. Thank you that you have mercy on us as well. May we be prepared at any time for a moment when life may change. We don't know what may happen tomorrow. We don't know what may happen in the laws of this land. We don't know what happened in our physical lives with our family. But may we prepare ourselves in our hearts to follow you whatever journey you may have for us. We thank you. Keep us through this day. In Jesus' name, amen.